spite of the mourning and so on, the loss in their family, but we thank God for them. We have been praying for them, and they're back in time for convention. Welcome home, missionaries. Bless you. Of course, put your hands together one more time for me. For Mr. Karen Leila. Bless the Lord. We thank God for her and for the support that she has been given in this ministry. Our preacher tonight has been preaching the gospel for close to two decades. And as a third generation minister, the responsibility to reap this end time harvest of souls has been ingrained in him from childhood. Ted has been privileged to preach the gospel across the United States, as well as other nations of the world, with many creative miracles reported. Recently, the Lord instructed Ted to launch Miracle Word University, an online training resource to raise a new generation of leaders and equip believers for their God-given purpose. He's a graduate of Rima Bible Training Inc. Center and currently resides in Florida with his wife, Caroline, and their three children, Madeline, Brooklyn, and Teddy III. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and make welcome the other person, the evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. Let's give Jesus praise tonight if you love it. Every hand lifted all over the church. Father, in the mighty name that's above every name, we come to you tonight. We ask you, let every heart be open to receive the word of God. Don't let one of us leave unchanged. Let us leave changed by the mighty power of your spirit. Let the word penetrate our hearts tonight and leave us in a higher place than we started. We thank you, Lord, that whatever distraction was trying to set itself up to take us away from the faith that we focused, move that out of the way tonight. Let our faith be focused on what you're doing in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for it. And we give you praise. If you believe in somebody, shout a loud amen. Yes. And you can be seated tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you. How many are excited tonight? I want to tell you, God's got something good for us tonight. I can't wait. I'm going to pray for all of you in just a moment. And God has something special to release to you. It's exciting to be a part of this end time move of the Holy Ghost. As we've been talking about all week, Jesus is coming very soon. We see the prophetic signs all around us. We can see what's happening around the world. You know, our Bible is a miraculous book. This is a miracle book. This is not just like any other book. This is breathed from the mouth of God. This is God's holy, inerrant, sufficient word. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Amen. This word is alive. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. When this word goes into you tonight, life goes into you. When this word goes into you tonight, a fresh spirit of peace and joy goes into you. Let me just quickly exhort you about the power of the word. The word becomes whatever you need it to be. Can you say amen? First of all and foremost, the word is the power unto salvation. That's what the apostle said in Romans 1.16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So everybody say the word is power unto salvation. But it doesn't stop there. Number two, the Bible wants us to understand that the word is healing to your body. Oh, hallelujah. The writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 22, My child, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your heart. Meditate on it day and night. Then what does he say? For those that find this word, it is health to all their flesh and life 
to those that find it. This word is life and health to your flesh. Oh, hallelujah. It doesn't stop there. The Bible declares that this mighty word, it brings you prosperity and success. For God spoke to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. And he said, take this book of the law. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may observe to do all that is written therein. Then will you make your way prosperous and have good success. Joshua 1.8. So the word of God gives us the ability to prosper and have good success. Can you shout amen? Amen. But it doesn't stop there. The word of God becomes joy in your heart. Did you know that the prophet Jeremiah found this out firsthand? He said in Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, Lord, I found your word and I did eat it. And it became unto me the joy and rejoicing of my soul. Hallelujah. The word is joy. Pure joy. Oh, hallelujah. The word becomes whatever you need it to be. Do you know they tell us now, everybody realizes that your health is very clearly linked to your diet. We know this more than ever now. Doctors are telling us that what we eat, many people are, are sick because of what they eat. And so I was doing a study on this recently, and of course, of course we're made, we've been made very aware about things regarding diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease, and they tell us we shouldn't eat so much sugar, and you know, but I can't stop eating festival. I, I've been trying to stop, but I keep eating it. Hallelujah. It tastes so good when I eat it. I can't seem to stop. Hallelujah. But they tell you now that your blood doesn't know the difference whether you drink some Fanta or you eat Festival. It doesn't matter because when it goes in, they both become sugar in your bloodstream. So watch this. They look different going in, but once they get in, they're the same thing. Watch. Whether you eat Festival or you drink Fanta, it doesn't matter because they look different, but once they're inside your body, your blood doesn't know if it's festival or Fanta. Get this with me tonight. But see this, the word of God may look the same when we take it in, but the opposite happens. Once it gets inside, it becomes different things. Oh my goodness. Some people may hear this word tonight and they need salvation. When it gets into your body tonight, it can become salvation. There's some people in this room, you need healing in your body. When this word gets into you tonight, it's going to become healing to your flesh. Others here, you're struggling and you need a financial breakthrough. You need God to bless you financially. This word's going to get in you tonight and turn into prosperity and success. There's people here, the devil's tried to attack your mind. You don't have peace. You don't have joy. But tonight, this word's going into you. And just like the prophet Jeremiah, you will digest the mighty word of God. And it will become joy and rejoicing. It looks the same going in. But once it gets inside. It becomes what you need it to be. The word is powerful. I said the word is powerful. The word is powerful. <laughs> oh, I feel joy in the house. The word is powerful. The word, oh my goodness, I feel like preaching. Now understand this, Jesus is the word. John chapter 1 tells us he's the word made flesh and he dwelt among us. Full of grace and truth. So we know that Jesus is the word. But let's go a step further. The Bible also tells us God is the word. For the Bible says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So God is his word. Let me just flip the whole I don't know if you can get this tonight. If you can receive what I'm about to say. I've never said it before, but God gave it to, you, to me for you tonight. Hold your Bible in your hand like this. 
This is extreme. Now, this is why we reverence this book. This is not like any other book. This doesn't go on my bookshelf with other books because it's not like other books. I don't throw this in the dashboard of my car until next Sunday because this is a holy book. I, I, I don't let this book sit on the shelf and get dusty. This is a holy book. Oh my goodness. This doesn't belong in the bathroom. This isn't bathroom reading. This is a holy book. This is the mighty word of the most high God. So everybody say this with me. The word was with God and the word was God. Hold that Bible up. Look at the Bible in your hand. And let me encourage you with this thought. You are holding God in your hand. I am holding God in my hand. Why? Because the word was with God and the word was God. This word cannot be separated from God who gave it to us. It's not just something that came out of his mouth. It is him in spoken form. Oh, let me go a step further so you see what I'm talking about. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8, there was an Italian soldier who came to find Jesus. And when he came to find Jesus, he said, Lord, he said, my servant is at home, sick with palsy. Jesus, being full of compassion, said, I will come to your house and I will heal the man. He said, no, no, Lord. You don't have to come to my house. I've been watching you and I know who you are because I'm a man of authority. And when I speak to my men and tell them to go, they go. And when I tell them to come, they come. And I notice that you're the same, except not in the natural, in the supernatural. And when you tell demons to go, they must go. And when you tell healing to come, it must come. So you don't have to come to my house, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be made whole. If you are taking notes tonight, write down this phrase and never forget it. I'll give you a moment to grab a pen because this will change your life. This God gave me in prayer and fasting. I'll never forget it. He said the power of my spirit. The power of my spirit travels in the vehicle of my word. The power of my spirit travels in the vehicle of my word. I've heard some people say, oh my God, we had church last week. The choir sang the entire time and the preacher never even preached. We had a church service. You didn't have a service because until the word goes forth, the power can't go forth. Until the word goes forth, then the anointing of God is not manifested because God honors his word above his name watch this he said you don't have to come to my house the power of his spirit travels in the vehicle of his word watch you don't have to come to my house speak the word only and my servant Jesus said oh I've not seen faith like this in all of Israel you know what Jesus was saying? Even my people, my own children, they don't even believe me like this. You've got a level of faith in my power that I've never seen. You know why? Because the Roman soldier didn't want to get in on the lower level. See, because this story shows you that the laying on of hands is not the highest level of manifestation. Jesus said, I'll come lay my hands. He said, you don't have to lay your hands. I got a higher faith than that. Just speak a word. The words that I give to you are spirit and they are life. And Jesus spoke a word. 
Let me show you what happened. When he spoke a word, he opened up his mouth and released the word of God. The word already had a passenger on the inside of it. The passenger was the power of the Holy Ghost. And the word began to travel. The word jumped on the highway. The word was going from Kingston to Port Moore. And as the word began to travel, it was carrying on the inside of it the power of his spirit. And when the word pulled up to where the servant was sick with palsy, the door opened up and out stepped the power of the spirit. And whatever sickness was causing him to be laid up in bed was destroyed by the power of the spirit. But it arrived in the vehicle of the word. This was a fulfillment of prophecy. Can I tell you the prophecy? Psalm 107 and verse 20. The Bible says he sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. He sent his what? Word. He sent his what? Word. He sent his word. When you hold this word, you are holding God himself because you can't separate God from his word. He is his word. He is his word. He is his word. Is his word. Get this with me tonight. He is his word. Oh, hallelujah. That's why when there's an enemy who opposes God, he doesn't have to get off of the throne. He can just speak the word only. And when his word comes out of his mouth, and when his word arrives in front of the enemy, it is God standing there, although he never got off the throne. Because the same power that's in his body on the throne is the same power that's inside his word. And when the word shows up, the enemy of your life has to respond the same to the word as it would to God himself. Because you can't separate God from his word. Cannot separate God from his word. You know what the Bible says. If you have it, turn to Isaiah 55. You know what it says. Let me read it to you. You can still turn, but I'm going to read Isaiah, Isaiah 55 and verse 8. We'll start there. God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Go further. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and as the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Look at verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have sent it. It shall prosper. It shall prosper. Why? Because when God sends his word, he is sending himself. And it's impossible for your God to fail. God cannot fail. I said God cannot fail. God cannot fail. God cannot fail. Cannot fail. And if God can't fail, then his word cannot fail. His word cannot fail. <laughs> His word can never fail. See, we understand. I'm going I'm to take you a little deeper with this. Oh, hallelujah. Because I'm, I'm going to take, before I pray for it, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to bring it all back around to the beginning. But know this first. Everyone in this room knows how powerful the name of Jesus is. Yeah. At that name, 
every knee has to bow. Every tongue has to confess. You know why I like that scripture? Because the Bible does not say Christian knees will bow. It says every knee. That means not just Christians. Atheist knees will bow. Muslim knees will bow. Buddhist knees will bow. Oh, Hindu knees will bow. New age knees will bow. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Even Rasta knees will bow. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't wait till I get to that day. Every Rasta knee will bow. I'll walk by full of the Holy Ghost as every one of them bowing down. And I'll say, Wagwan. And I'll keep on walking. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, you're not saying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His word. Somebody say his word. We know how powerful the name of Jesus is. It's powerful. I said it's powerful. The word. Now here's what I like. I started to read the book of Psalms. And I came across Psalm 138 verse 2. And the Bible says he magnifies his word above his name. He said my word is so powerful I'll even lift it above my name. Think about this. If the name is so powerful that it forces heathen to their knees. If the name of Jesus is so powerful that he said in the New Testament, when I leave the earth, he said, you'll do these same things in my name. You shall cast out devils. In my name, you'll heal the sick. In my name, you'll speak with new tongues. In my name, if you eat or drink any deadly thing, it will not harm you. In my name, you'll handle snakes with safety. In my name, you'll tread on serpents and scorpions. In my name, his name makes the impossible possible. I said his name makes the impossible possible. And we know that his name is the most powerful name in the universe. There's no other name above the name of Jesus. None. Let me say this to you. Anything, I feel this, anything that has a name has a need. Write it down. Anything that has a name has a knee. And if it has a knee, it must bow. Cancer must bow. Type 2 diabetes must bow. Arthritis must bow. Glaucoma must bow. Mesothelioma must bow. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Anything with a name is lesser than the name that's above all names. <laughs> the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. But God said, I will exalt or magnify my word even above my name. So if you think how powerful his name is, imagine how powerful his word is. I said to you last night, I told you, everything you see in this earth came out of his mouth. <laughs> what you're wearing on your body tonight came out of his mouth. Uh, what you drive or ride on to get to church came out of his mouth. I'm sitting here, you get to realize this, people don't realize this, my phone that I'm looking at the internet on came out of his mouth. What we're live streaming on right now, as she films this, it came out of his mouth. You say a phone came out of his mouth, he put every one of these elements in the earth and then gave the wisdom to men to pull it out of the earth and to create it into what you see tonight. But man didn't make this 
God made this out of his mouth it came. Out of his mouth comes everything you see. His word is power. <laughs> his word is power. His word is power. His word is power. His word is power. Let me go a step further. His word holds more weight than the president or prime minister. Hear what I say tonight. It doesn't matter what laws are passed that would try to stop you from being blessed. Nobody can curse what God has blessed. I don't care. I don't care if it becomes illegal in this country to preach the mighty word of God. If they say, if you preach that Bible, we'll put you in jail. I'll preach it from a jail cell because I don't care. Who should I serve, men or God? Who should I serve, men or God? I came to tell you that we serve the God that's above every man. His name is above every name. I was studying on one of my favorite preachers who got on to be with the Lord now. He was a rough, rough man. But he was from Nigeria, Benin City. And it was a Muslim-controlled government. And he would say, whatever the devil tells you not to do, do it anyway. And they knew that the Christian gatherings were getting bigger and bigger, Holy Ghost filled people gathering and the crowds growing. So the government would get on public television in Nigeria and say, everybody must be in their house, curfew, by 8 p.m. When he heard that Muslim-controlled government give orders to keep, the reason they were doing that is to keep Christians from going to their meeting. He got on TV right after the government, and he said, we're having a revival meeting tonight. It starts at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Whatever the devil says you can't do, do it twice. I said, if he tells you you can't do it, do it twice. I had people come to me. These must have been dead Christians that don't know the Holy Ghost. They came to me and said, hey, Brother Ted, are people still having revival in America? Are people still going to church night after night in America? I don't think people do that anymore. They came to me. They said, how do you still uh, have, hold revivals across America? I didn't know pastors were doing that. I think the days of week-long revival services are over. When I heard that, you know what I started doing? I started calling up the pastors and telling them, we're not going to have service at 7 p.m. We're going to have service at 12 and 7 p.m. Whatever the devil tells you you can't do, do it twice. Hallelujah. Because the word of God that's working on your behalf is stronger than any enemy sin against you. His word is him. I said his word is him. <laughs> his word is him. His word is him. His word is him. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. When Mary gave birth, shh, the word came out of her. The word began to cry as she held the word in her arms. I know. I could get into preaching this tonight, but see, y'all don't want to know about this, but the word is nutrition for your body. Even Jesus himself said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. I, let me, I, I'm just going to drop this on you real quick. You put this, you just think about this. This is how careful God is. Yes, Jesus was the bread of life. Yes, he is the bread of life. Yes, Where did they place him? In a manger. A manger is not a crib. A manger is not a bed. You know what a manger is? It's a plate for animals to eat out of. God sent the bread and put it on a plate. Do you know what city he was born in? Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means in the Hebrew language? Beth 
house lechem of bread, the house of bread, the bread of life was born in the house of bread and set on a plate. I came to tell you that Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not worthy to be called mine. He was born to be eaten. I said he was born to be eaten when the bread of life comes into your spirit. Everything that was sin against you has to be destroyed by the power of the word. Jeremiah said it plainly. I found your word. I did eat it. There was a great man of God named F.F. F. Bosworth. He wrote a book called Christ the Healer. He said the reason many Christians are frustrated is because they feed their body three hot meals a day and their spirit one cold snack a week. And they wonder why there's no revival. They wonder why there's no healing. They wonder why there's no breakthrough. Because God doesn't honor your feelings. God doesn't honor your traditions. God doesn't honor anything but his word. And when his word comes in, his word will do what no other power can do. His word will lift you up. Somebody say the word. word. See, God is his word. That's why even in the Old Testament, they thought they were so smart that they had the name of God down. Oh, we know his name. His name is Jehovah. Until they found out one name wasn't enough to describe how big God was. <laughs> so they had to start giving him compound names because they started to realize he is what he does. He is what he does. They thought he was just Jehovah until he told them, I am the God that healeth you. I am the God. And then they said, he's not just Jehovah. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals me because he is what he does. And when their mind was troubled with fear, when their mind was troubled with depression, he said, I'll be the God of your peace. And they said, oh, he's not just Jehovah Rapha. He's Jehovah Shalom, the God of my peace. When their righteousness was as filthy rags, they couldn't be righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. But Jeremiah said, the Lord God is our righteousness. They said, oh, he's not just Jehovah Rapha, and he's not just Jehovah Shalom. He's Jehovah Sittenu, the God of our righteousness. Abraham found out he was Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. I came to tell you tonight that God is what he does. Huh. God is what he does. I read a scripture that confused me. I was in Deuteronomy reading and I heard a promise God made to his people. And he said, your enemies will come out against you from one direction, but they'll flee from you in seven directions. I said, God, why do my enemies come from one direction and leave in seven directions? He said, because understand this, although all of your enemies are coming from one direction, they're not all coming to do the same thing to you. He said, some of your enemies are coming to make you fall back into sin. They're coming to attack your righteousness. Some of your enemies are coming to make you sick, steal your health, bring disease on your body. Other of your enemies have come to take your joy and to take your peace, to mess with your mind. There's enemies that are trying to come at you to touch your finances and to make you poor. He said, though all those enemies are coming from one direction, he said, the thing is, the battle's not your battle. The battle is my battle. He said, because your enemies are different, 
every one of them is not going to meet the same God. He said, when the ones come to steal your righteousness, they're going to meet Jehovah Sitkanu, who is the God of your righteousness. And I'll send them in one direction. Those that come to bring sickness to you, they're going to meet Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals you. And I'm going to send them in another direction. Those that come to mess with your provision, they're going to meet Jehovah Jireh. And I'll send them in another direction. Those that come to take your peace, they'll meet Jehovah Shalom. And I'll send them in another direction. And by the time I'm done working on your behalf, your enemies will have come from one way, but they're leaving you seven ways in the name that's above every name. So I shout aloud, amen. amen. Shout aloud, amen. amen. Because God is what he does. He is what he does. He is what he does. His word is him. Uh, when the psalmist wrote, he sent his word and it healed them. The reason it could heal them is because he is his word. He is. <laughs> I could get into this. I'm writing a book on this right now. But do you realize that because, oh, I feel like preaching. See, that word that was made flesh until he received the breath of God, he was just like every other man. Although he was sinless, he had no power. Jesus had no power from age zero to age 30. How many miracles did he perform? None. Not one. We know the first miracle Jesus produced because John chapter 2 tells us this beginning of miracles did Jesus at Cana of Galilee. His first miracle was at 30 years old. What changed? in the life of Jesus. He was baptized in the Jordan River. And when he came out of the water, the heavens opened up. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And Jesus, Luke chapter four and verse one, was led into the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost. What changed in Jesus? It's that the Son of God received the breath of God. Oh my goodness. The same thing that made Adam a living being, God blew the breath of life into him, is the same thing that made Christ alive. God blew the breath one more time from heaven and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. That same spirit that came out of God's mouth into Adam's body is the same spirit that came out of God's mouth into Jesus' body. And when he was filled with the breath of life, when he spoke, life came out of his mouth. I want you to take your hand like this and put it in front of your mouth and say, power. Did you feel that? Can you feel that word come onto your head? Say it again, power. You feel it. You know why you feel it? Because it's impossible to speak without breath coming out. That's what I feel like preaching here. It's impossible to speak without breath coming out. That's why when Jesus stood in front of Lazarus' tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. The breath of life came out of his mouth, went into the tomb, and shook Lazarus back to life. Jesus didn't have to go in and lay hands on him. He sent the word. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Jesus was dead in the grave three days. And God sent the breath again. And Romans 8, 11 records the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. God blew his breath one more time. 
It came into the tomb and grabbed a dead, lifeless, decomposing body and shook it back to life. God wasn't done blowing his breath. Because after Jesus ascended into heaven, he'd already told his disciples, go wait in Jerusalem. Till you be filled with what? Power. What kind of power were they about to receive? They were about to receive the breath of life. What's the first thing that happened on the day of Pentecost? And they heard a sound from heaven. What was the sound like? A rushing mighty. God was blowing his breath one more time. And when he blew his breath from heaven, oh the same breath that brought Adam to life, the same breath that brought Jesus to life, the same breath that brought Lazarus to life, was the same breath that brought us to life tonight. It's the breath of God, the Holy Ghost, that gets into our bodies. And wake up! Now when we speak, the breath of life comes out. That's why we can speak to the mountain. I preached last night. And we don't doubt in our heart what happens. The breath of life that's in our mouth comes out in power and begins to move enemies out of the way. Now this might be a lot for some people to process. But think about this thought. Because we've been filled with the breath of life, God gave us the ability to be omnipresent. What? How can we be all places at once? I can speak something from Brooklyn and change something in Montego Bay right now. Because the word knows no distance. The word knows no boundaries. The Bible says the word of God is not bound. It's not locked up in this room with us tonight. We can speak the word of God and loved ones back in Jamaica have to receive the power of God tonight. Those that couldn't be at this convention tonight, we can speak a word out of our mouth and there's no distance between here and where they are. I was preaching in Pennsylvania holding a revival. And I got a message from a young girl, high school age girl on my phone through social media. She said, I really wanted to be in the revival services, but my mother didn't want me to come to church. She said, because she doesn't believe like we believe. She said, you can't go to that church. They're Pentecostal people. She said, they talk in tongues. They dance around the church. They're crazy people. I don't want my daughter going to some Pentecostal revival. Isn't it a crazy day we live in, Bishop? When parents don't care if their kids go to parties, they don't care if they go get drunk, they don't care if they go hook up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, they don't care if they go do drugs, just don't go to a Pentecostal church. What kind of day are we living in? that parents would rather have their kids party than they would pray. What kind of a day are we living in that parents would rather have their kids go have sex than they would come into the house of God and receive the scripture? What in the world is going on? I'll tell you, we're living in the final moments of time. And the girl wrote back to me and she said, I really needed to come because I was born with a sickness in my body and I was believing that when I came to the revival you would lay your hands on me and pray and God would heal me of the sickness she said but my mama said no and I didn't want to be rebellious and I didn't want to be disobedient so I went up the stairs of our house walked into my room and I closed the door and she said, but she didn't say I couldn't watch it on Facebook. So I pulled my phone out and I turned on the service and I was amening you from my room. She said, but at the end of the service, you looked into the camera and you prayed the prayer of faith. And when you prayed that prayer, and loose the word. I felt something come out of my phone and get into my body. And the sickness I was born with had to run out of my bedroom. Because the word of God knows no distance, knows no boundary. The word of God is not bound. It is the power of 
the most high God. Somebody shout yes. Clap your hands if you believe it tonight. What kind of shit to do? The word of God is not bound. We can speak the word. Send it. What devil thinks it's going to stand in the way of the word of God we sent tonight? I tell you, every enemy must flee. Every sickness must go. Every depression must leave. The power of God is greater. Let me finish before we pray. Go to Mark chapter 5. The word holds within it virtue to change your life. When I say the word virtue, I mean heavenly substance and power. Heavenly substance and power. Kura Heavenly substance and power. Mark 5, you know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says here in verse 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Somebody say 12 years too long. And had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Let me stop there. I thank God for the work of doctors and nurses. But I want to clearly say to you tonight that doctors and nurses and the care they provide to you, medical care, is different than divine healing. Divine healing comes from God. Divine healing is a supernatural work of heaven. I've heard people say, well, brother, I believe God uses the doctors and nurses when they operate. I ask, uh, I ask my pastor, please pray that God would guide the surgeon's hand as he operates on my body. God doesn't use doctors and nurses unless they're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and lay their hands on you and pray the prayer of faith. Because medical help is not the same as divine healing. Here's why it's not. How many have read the scripture in the Bible where the Bible declares that we serve a jealous God? How many have read that verse of scripture? We serve a jealous God. It doesn't mean he's like a little teenage girl that got their first boyfriend. It means that he's a God who wants all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, all the magnitude. So what would happen is this. If God would do something that would bring confusion as to who did the work, he doesn't get all the glory. He doesn't get all the praise. If God was using surgery to make you whole, then who gets the glory? Does the surgeon get the glory or does God get the glory? If God was using your medication to make you whole, who gets the glory? The pharmaceutical company or the God that lives in heaven? I tell you, when God heals you, he doesn't need a surgery to do it. He doesn't need medication to do it. He doesn't need any kind of help from the north. I came to help somebody with this because the God we serve is able to do exceeding abundantly and above all that you can ask for. And the Bible says, Peter, the apostle, said in Acts 10, 34, I perceive God is no respecter of persons. Well, if that's the case, what he does for one, he must do for all. So if God does use doctors and nurses, here's a case in the Bible where he failed to do so. Because this Bible tells us she suffered for 12 years and had dealt with many doctors and spent all she had. And God didn't use the doctors. God didn't use the medication. God didn't use the nurses. What 
does this scripture tell us? It tells us she got no help from the doctor. She got no help from the medication. So she came to the source of supernatural power. She said, what my doctor could not do for me, my God can do for me. What medication could not do for me, my God can do for me. He's the great physician. He's the almighty one. She got nothing better. She got worse. But she heard of Jesus. She heard of Jesus. I'm not against doctors and nurses. If it wasn't for them, half the church would be dead by now. I'm not against them. I thank God for their wisdom. But let's not confuse what they do by wisdom for divine healing. No, we have a supernatural God. His power does not need to be supplemented by man-made things. The Bible says when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. Let me just say to you tonight, Jesus didn't even know she was there. She didn't get a miracle because Jesus prayed for her. She didn't get a miracle because he was holding a prayer line. She didn't get a miracle because she became a monthly partner with his ministry and had just received his newsletter in the mail and had found that he'd sent her a prayer cloth. No, he didn't even know she was there. She said in her own heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made whole. I could preach on this for a moment and tell you that Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was wearing garments that were made for the rabbis. If you go back and study what type of garments they wore, you'll see that at the hem of the garment, the robe they wore, there was a hem and it had a borderline. And in the border was sewn the names of God. Oh, I feel like preaching. And when she reached out and touched the hem, she actually touched the name of God. And when she touched the name that's above every name, her faith made a withdrawal. <laughs> Her faith made a withdrawal. Do you know what she recognized? Jesus holds power on the inside of him. But if I touch him, I can pull some of that power out. And when I pull that power out, it'll get in my body. And then when it gets in my body, whatever this evil thing is, that's been making me sick for 12 years. One little touch from his power will drive out every sickness and every disease. One little touch of his power will make every demon run for the door. One little touch of his power, everything has to turn. Uh, I'll finish here. The Bible says, and straightway, that means immediately, right away, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. Let me stop here and teach you something. There's some people that miss out on their healing because after they get prayed for, they say, I don't feel anything. Notice this. She didn't feel it before the healing. She felt it after. It wasn't feeling and then healing. It was healing and then feeling. <laughs> and verse 30, and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Oh. We know the disciples said, look at all these people. 
Why do you say who touched me? He said, I felt virtue. And finally, the Bible says, she confessed all that she'd done. Verse 34, he said unto her daughter, your faith has made you whole. He didn't say my faith made you whole. He said your faith made you whole. And go in peace and be whole of your plague. Let me show you something before I lay my hands on you and pray. She had an understanding that there was supernatural virtue inside the word. What I'm talking to you about all night tonight, the power that's inside the word. She said, if I'll touch the word, I'll pull power out of the word. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not preaching on this tonight, but if you go over five more chapters, Mark 10, you know about the man named Bartimaeus who was blind. He couldn't even see, but he heard. What were the people saying? Jesus of Nazareth is passing. Now watch, watch, watch. Jesus of Nazareth was not Jesus' messianic name. That's the name people called him when they wanted to call him just a plain old human. They'd say, oh, yeah, 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 it's Jesus of Nazareth. We know who he is. He's the one who Mary, his mama, got pregnant before she was ever with Joseph. We know we don't know who her, who his father really is. We know Joseph been raising him, but that ain't his boy. His mom was pregnant before she ever got with Joseph. He's Jesus from Nazareth, the one that's been making rocking chairs in the carpenter's shop. They're trying to point at his humanity. You need to get this. But when Bartimaeus heard that they said, here comes Jesus of Nazareth, what did he say? He said, Jesus, son of David. Son of David was his messianic name. That meant he was the Messiah. Do you see? A man who couldn't even see saw more about Jesus than people who had their sight. He said, you might be looking for a carpenter, but I'm not looking for a carpenter because a carpenter can't build me new eyeballs. I need the Messiah to touch me. I'm not looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I'm looking for Jesus, son of David, to touch me tonight. And when he touches me, I will be made whole. I want you to stand on your feet all over this church. You might need a miracle in your life. Tonight is your night to receive it. There's virtue in this house. I said there's virtue in this house. I've lost track of the week. I don't even remember what day it is. Is it Tuesday? Tuesday. Is it Wednesday? Tuesday. There's power on a Tuesday night in the house of God. <laughs> oh, I feel the anointing. My sister, lift your hands right here. The anointing's on you. The power of God comes upon you tonight. Virtue from heaven flows into your body. Ha, 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 ha. Come now. Fill with the virtue of heaven. Fill with the virtue of heaven. You might need a miracle tonight. We've seen God do it and do it again. Do it and do it again. You know, nothing's hard for God. Nothing is hard for God. I heard some preacher say it like this. Nothing's too hard for God. Let me go further. Nothing's even hard. It's not that nothing's too hard. Nothing's hard. Nothing's hard. Nothing's hard. He's a mighty Savior. Can I pray for you? May I pray for you? Please, please stand with Lift your hands. Tonight God is touching you supernaturally. I saw two things God's doing for you. Number one, there have been moments relatively recently and then stretching back where you've had severe hurts in the past, emotional hurts that have hung on to you almost like a chain pulling you back. And you felt like these things have held you so tight that you can't move forward in God. You can't go where God's called you to go. But I hear the Holy Ghost say tonight, 
He severs those things off of you that were holding you back. He cuts it from heaven and sets you free tonight. Number two, the enemies tried to attack you. And even though you're a very young woman, there's been a weakness that's tried to come over your body recently. Over the last month, you felt weakness. Just You stand up and say, oh, what is that? I need to sit back down. You feel like it's trying to sap your strength. I tell you, that's a spirit of infirmity that's trying to come upon you. And I rebuke it tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Not only does God set you free, but tonight the healing anointing of heaven comes into your body. And I take authority over every attack of the enemy that's come against your life. Go in the name of Jesus. Be free. Be free by the power of the Most High. From this night forward, I declare you never be the same again. Never be the same again. Never be the same again. Never be the same. Oh, Rabbi, never be the same. Never. 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 Be the same again. Somebody lift your hand. Worship the name of Jesus. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Roger, we are my Rakatala. Marosha, the Rokotala. Raja Patala. No Rokotala. Ask the Kikia. The miracle anointing is here tonight. Uh, if you need a miracle, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. God's going to touch you. God's going to touch you. Setting you free tonight. You'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same again. Uh, Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Pusha de 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 If you need healing in your body, I want you to get out of your seat and come to God's altar tonight. You need healing in your body. You need a miracle. Come now. Just leave me sitting in the back and come in front of you and pray. If you need healing, come quick.
Miracles belong to God's children. Healing is the children's bread. That's what the Bible said. A woman who did not belong to the house of Israel came to Jesus expecting to receive the daughter. He said, I can't take what is the children's bread and give it to dogs. But her faith was greater than that. She said, Lord, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. Not, every, not, not any of us here have to say, that's my story. And if you're here tonight, listen to me, bow your head. If you're going to receive the bread of God, you have to be the child of God. I want every head to be bowed. There's even one person that's standing here tonight or you're in your seat. You say, I have sin in my life. I'm not ready to see Jesus. I want to know tonight that, my, that heaven is my home. Jesus is my Lord. That I'm ready to spend eternity with God. Look into your life tonight. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Is he pointing at something that's displeasing to God? If so, when we pray this prayer, I want you to pray with me. Know that all things are made new. Tonight is your night. If you're in this church, you say, Preacher, that's me. There's things in my life displeasing to God. Sinful. I want to be free before you pray this prayer of deliverance. Right where you are, lift your hand and hold it high and I'm going to pray. Wherever you are, don't be ashamed. See here, here, here. Over here, over there. Back in the back, over here. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Every one of you that are with your hand, those are the seats and those that are here at the altar. Pray this with me now. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. I, thank I thank you tonight for the saving power of Christ. The saving power of Christ. When he shed his blood he shed his on the cross of Calvary. The for the remission of my sin. For the remission of my sin. I confess with my mouth. Confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is I believe Lord. in my heart. I in my heart. You, raised him from the dead. you raised him from the dead. And tonight I'm saved. Sin is gone from my life. No longer am I a child of the devil. I'm a child of God. And if I am, that means healing is mine. It was provided for me through this covenant of salvation. I received my miracle tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Lift your hands all over this house. We're going to worship in one moment. I'm going to come and lay my hands upon you. Let me pray for every one of you now. Father, in Jesus' name, as I get ready to come and lay my hands on your precious children, whatever was attacking their body, whatever was coming against them, tonight I rebuke it in the mighty name of Jesus. I command it to loose its grip, to let them go, and I lose healing from heaven into their bodies tonight. I thank you tonight is their night to receive a mighty miracle in Jesus' name. If you believe it, somebody shout amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord tonight.